Good morning, Mr. Good morning. We hope to carry out peritoneobilitis on you this morning. This is a simple procedure and shouldn't cause you very much pain. During the procedure of peritoneodialysis, small molecular weight substances which are collected in the bloodstream in high concentration in renal failure cross the semi-permeable membrane of the peritoneum to an area of low concentration, on this occasion the dialysate contained within the peritoneal cavity. If we wish to remove water from the patient, we increase the concentration of glucose in the peritoneal dialysate. Peritoneal dialysis can now be used for the vast majority of patients with acute renal failure waiting their recovery, or for those with chronic renal failure waiting entry to a regular dialysis program or transplantation. It is also used in patients with severe poisoning with compounds that are not tightly bound to protein and in acute pancreatitis or sometimes post-operatively in severe peritonitis. Also on occasion in heart failure with intractable edema resistant to diuretics. The advantages of peritoneal dialysis are that it can be set up in the simplest of circumstances with a minimum of delay and without sophisticated monitoring. Access to the bloodstream is not required and anticoagulation is unnecessary. Good morning. Good morning. Mr. McKee, I'm going to leave you in the hands of Dr. Snowden now, who's going to carry out the procedure. Hello, Mr. McKee. Good morning. I just want to have a look at your tummy. All right. That's fine. Now we'll get ready to start. Beforehand, a trolley will be laid up with a catheter set, scalpel, and other instruments, local anaesthetic, sutures, paper towels, gloves and gauze, antiseptic solution, elastoplast, and sterile pack. The whole procedure is very simple and usually no worse than uncomfortable for the patient. The youngest, though, may require sedation. The skin and subcutaneous tissue is infiltrated with 1% lignocaine. In advance, packs of the selected dialysis solution will have been raised to just above blood temperature. The comfort of patients depends on accurate temperature control. They tend to complain most about a chilly intra-abdominal sensation. The giving set has been removed from its box and the sterile envelope is opened up. At this stage, the nurse usually puts on a mask. Later, for sterile aspects of the procedure, she will, of course, scrub up and glove. A syringe is filled with 200 units of heparin for later addition to the solution in the pack. The trolley is now ready to be brought to the patient's bedside for the main procedure. The bladder should have been emptied if the patient is not a neuric, by catheter if unconscious. The peritoneal dialysis catheter with stilet in position is pushed right through so that liquid will flow not into the abdominal wall but into the peritoneal cavity. The stilet is then partially withdrawn to avoid perforating gut or blood vessels as the catheter moves onward. The tip is gently pushed right down into the pelvic gutter on one side or the other of the empty bladder. A three millimeter incision is made if earlier scarring and other circumstances permit on the midline between pubis and the umbilicus. The nurse, meanwhile, is removing the sealing caps from the two bags, following which she swabs each penetrable closure with antiseptic solution. She will next inject the heparin dose into one of the bags, which is adequate since the two run in together. If potassium chloride or antibiotics are to be given, they are added now. It remains to sort out the giving set and to push one piercing point into each pack before hanging the hole on an adjacent stand. The protruding tip of the stilet is inserted through the incision 
taking the catheter with it, but so gently that the risk of damage to the underlying bowel is minimised. Then the stilette tip is withdrawn and the catheter itself slowly threaded down into the correct deep bedded position. Properly conducted, this manoeuvre disturbs the patient very little. The nurse, having previously prepared the set and run liquid through to remove bubbles and then switched off, now passes the distal tip to the doctor, who proceeds to connect up to the indwelling catheter. The heparin warning label is put on. Any trace of bleeding about the catheter at the site of the incision may be easily controlled by making a purse string suture around it, though on occasion this occlusion may not be needed. The whole circuit is completed with the drainage arm to a measured sterile drum. To hold the catheter firmly in place and to prevent its kinking, Strips of adhesive dressing will be put in position across the site. Inflow occupies some 10 minutes. Then, all clamps closed, 20 minutes of dwell time will be allowed in the peritoneum. Equilibrium is reached and the siphoning takes another 20 minutes or so. When peritoneal dialysis is begun, it is important to check the patient's drug regime and, if necessary, to vary it, as drugs are removed during dialysis and similarly alterations to the diet are called for. It is important to relax the low protein regime in favour of a diet containing up to one gram of protein per kilogram body weight per day. During the course of treatment, careful monitoring of several kinds is carried out. In cases of massive edema, for instance, the water loss from tissue may be dangerously sudden and unexpected falls in blood pressure will give warning. Blood pressure should be taken at least three hourly. For the same reason, a check on input-output is made. Patients being weighed before and after treatment, or daily if on long dialysis. They are mobile, and the indwelling catheter presents no problem. However, to reduce risk of infection, many units prefer to implant a fresh catheter each time, using a multiple puncture technique. Peritoneal dialysis is quite possible even in a sitting position. Following final drainage from the peritoneum, the effluent will be carefully measured and sample cultures taken from it will warn of possible infection. Serum electrolyte monitoring will check that a suitable solution has been used. To continue dialysis, further packs will have been raised to just over blood temperature. And now, during the outflow period, another pair is laid up in readiness. With a heating cabinet, it is easy to continue as long as may be necessary, usually for up to 24 or even 30 cycles. Three solutions are available, none of which contain potassium, since most patients on peritoneal dialysis are hyperkalemic. For those on long-term dialysis, potassium may have to be added. Dialaflex 61 is slightly hypertonic and so corrects overhydration and reduces edema. Dialaflex 62 is markedly hypertonic and is suitable for rapid removal of edema, but beware of hypovolemic shock. 61 and 62 may be used together in parallel packs to obtain a dextrose concentration halfway between the two. 63 gives reduced sodium concentration where such is indicated as, for instance, in cases of severe hypertension. Now for the contraindications. Multiple abdominal scars from past surgery form one, of course, as does any recent operation in which the peritoneum has been opened and is no longer intact. Patients in a hypercatabolic state should be given hemodialysis. An important contraindication would be any defect in the diaphragm, such, for instance, as hiatus hernia. Because of upward pressure on the diaphragm when the peritoneum contains an extra two litres of fluid, the complication of partial collapse of the lower lobes may arise, leading to pneumonia or pleural effusions. But the most likely complication is peritonitis. A careful aseptic technique is called for, particularly when changing packs. 
Pneumonia can become a complication or be a contraindication for starting the procedure. A one litre cycle may be used in cases of respiratory depression and for those on a long course, breathing exercises are helpful. Perforations of the gut or blood vessels occasionally arise and immediate laparotomy may be required. Loss of fluid into tissues can be avoided, as we have seen, by getting the catheter well down into the peritoneal sac. Hypovolemia may arise from too rapid removal of body fluid without adequate replacement. Protein and amino acid loss must be watched for at the laboratory level, especially in patients on long-term treatment. So must electrolyte imbalance. Occasionally, blockage of the catheter occurs, even when it's not kinked. Heparin will prevent this clotting, but to unblock, a large syringe full of sterile saline should be injected directly into the tube, which should have been disconnected just above the catheter. You've now seen the simplicity of the method of peritoneal dialysis, how it causes the minimum of disturbance to the patient. There's no reason why this technique should not be used in any hospital or even on occasion in the home.